Yes, hello everyone, um, and it's a great pleasure to um, be speaking to you today um, from Cambridge. I'm uh, great. <laughs> I'm disappointed that I can't join you in person, but um, I'm uh, very pleased that you've asked me to speak about this. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll I'll talk about um, both uh, European modelling of what might happen to the electricity system with um, additional amounts of renewable energy. And I'll also uh, talk a little bit about uh, recent experiences um, with renewable energy in uh, Great Britain. Um, so let me uh, just outline what I'm, I'm going to look at. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll start off by talking about um, what renewables mean for electricity markets and how uh, electricity market design might need to change in the near future. Um, then I'll talk about um, how much renewables we might have in a net zero uh, energy system in uh, Europe. And um, it turns out that renewables will uh, be extremely significant in future uh, electricity systems. Um, and then I'm going to end up by talking about um, experiences with adding um, wind and solar to the electricity system in Great Britain and indeed what that has meant for uh, ancillary service markets of the type that Mr. Uh, Ito was talking about. So let me start off by uh, talking about renewables and what they mean for electricity market design and electricity market prices. Um, so uh, what uh, happens with uh, renewables is that, um, as was me mentioned earlier, um, they uh, can be uh, zero marginal cost in the short run. And that would seem to pose a problem for existing electricity markets, which are premised on non-zero marginal costs uh, associated with fossil fuels. And seeing we have uh, existing wholesale electricity markets, which are based on high marginal costs and which have been designed around um, that type of fuel, um, that might seem to suggest that we will need another type of electricity market which allows uh, the right incentives to be introduced for investing in renewables in the first place, but also for um, making sure that we've got enough uh, reserves on the system. And so when we were thinking about this um, uh, going forward, we were thinking, well, what is gonna happen to electricity prices in Europe in the next uh, few years? Because if electricity prices were to often be zero, um, because of the addition of renewables and to be extremely volatile and to provide a bad investment signal for new renewables being added to the electricity system, clearly we would have to change the existing market design. Um, so when we think about this uh, in terms of the timetable for changing market design, if we're going to change the market design by, say, 2030, we need to be thinking about, well, what are the prices going to be in the mid-2020s? Uh, because they'll be the prices that uh, politicians will be interested in, um, in driving um, political pressure to change market design. Um, so um, what this gives rise to is um, three... Um, potential questions to do with um, the future of European um, electricity market design. Um, and, you know, how is, how is the market working as we roll out more renewables is the first question. Could we just adapt to the market um, as we go along, perhaps with the introduction of capacity markets and better ancillary service markets to make sure that we have enough uh, capacity to support renewable generation. And um, as this rollout of renewables continues, will there be a sudden change to prices? Will you know the, the average price in the wholesale market suddenly collapse um, and no longer support the addition of new renewables or uh, the maintenance of reserve capacity? Um, 
these are all things which it, it, it's possible to uh, model. Um, and indeed, that's what we're um, going uh, on to look at. And indeed, those, those three questions suggest three options for the future, which are to do with um, a continuation of the current market design, um, a gradual evolution of the market design with the introduction of more ancillary service markets or better ancillary service markets that better incentivize the sorts of frequency response issues that we've just heard about or the maintenance, maintenance of longer term reserve capacity. Or indeed, might we just have to completely rethink uh, market design and, you know, a, a complete rethink of market design in the context of um, it, intermittent renewables would involve, um, say, internet based um, um, uh, allocation of capacity where we might pay for electricity under long term contracts, but in the short run, we allocate it according to availability of electricity and priorities uh, attached to uh, different loads rather than um, some. Um, uh, market-based pricing in the short run. So, um, so what we did um, to think about the 2025 market situation, which might drive future market design, was uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Cambridge uh, Kong Cheong, um, and I did some modelling of the 2025 electricity market in Europe um, to look at well, what might happen to prices as you add a lot more intermittent um, renewable generation. And of course, it's, it's not altogether clear that prices will collapse. That's important to say, because you, there are two things going on. It's true that as you add more renew, renew, um, variable uh, renewable electricity, uh, wind and solar, the marginal cost drops and the residual demand, which is met by non um, zero marginal cost generators falls. That's true. So that is the merit order effect, which people often focus on. But of course, there may be other things going on. The carbon price may be going up. And indeed, the price of gas, which has risen very much recently, uh, might also go up. And that would create a fuel price effect which would drive up the marginal cost so that a lot of the time, the marginal cost of the existing electricity system, even with more renewables, might be higher. And these two, two effects trade off and you would need careful modeling of what their net impact might be. And indeed, that's what we did in our modeling. We modeled the European electricity system. We more modeled different zones within it. Um, which are governed by availability of uh, transmission interconnections. So we can have different prices within the different zones if the uh, transmission lines are connected. And then we uh, looked at, well, what does this look like from a renewable generator point of view? Um, and here you need to think about, well, um, uh, what might be, um, going on um, in terms of the market situation. So we had some assumptions about how much renewables might be added by 2025. We had some baseline assumptions about what fo fossil fuels prices might be and what the carbon price might be. And then um, I'll just pick out one of the, um, the scenarios we looked at, which is this C2 scenario where uh, gas prices are higher than in the baseline and the carbon price is twice what it is in the baseline. Um, and those of you who know about the uh, carbon price in the European emissions trading system will know it's already up at about the level that we're modeling here uh, under um, C2. So um, that allows us to uh, uh, look at um, what the impact might be for different generators within the system. And we look, if we focus here on just two regions, the, the German region and the Italian region, and I've just picked out the German region, if gas and uh, carbon prices are high, um, 
renewable generators can recover quite high wholesale electricity prices. Um, and indeed, some renewable generators can recover more than the average wholesale generation price. If you're an offshore wind turbine, you tend to be generating in the high price hours, not in the, not in the low price hours. And you actually um, can recover more than the, uh, the wholesale cost. So this, this um, fuel price effect could be quite strong and could support the natural rollout of more renewable generation into the 2020s, um, reducing the need for subsidy and uh, under the existing uh, market design. Now, when we were looking at that, at this, um, we were using 2016 uh, costs of new renewable generation. And we modeled, well, how much does the cost in 2016 need to fall in order to be supported by the electricity prices that we were modeling? And some of the uh, results of, of that are here. And they show that, you know, the, the capital cost needs to fall by, um, say, 50 percent for some technologies. But actually, since 2016, we've already seen cost falls of that sort of order of magnitude for some of these renewable technologies, which suggests that the current market design will naturally um, lead to the continuing rollout of renewable generation. And you don't necessarily need a radical change to the market design in order to support ongoing decarbonization of the European electricity system. Um, uh, now, <laughs> that's good news for renewables, but that doesn't mean that the remaining uh, gas turbines on the system don't have a financing problem. They won't be used as often, that's true. And um, our modelling suggests the need for continuing use of capacity markets and sharper ancillary um, service. Um, market pricing in which pays gas turbines to provide ancillary services. Um, uh, interconnection certainly helps. And if fossil fuel plants close more quickly than ex expected, then that continues to put pressure on um, the need for more reserve capacity and that for that to be financed. Um, and certainly carbon pricing is playing a very important role in here in driving, in producing the merit order effect in the absence of high gas prices. Um, and uh, it interacts with higher gas prices in supporting the natural rollout of renewables and um, the maintenance of the current uh, market design. Um, of course, if renewables roll out more quickly, uh, gas prices are, are low and carbon prices are not high enough, um, these positive, um, si the positive situation for the current market design disappears and some more radical market design may be necessary uh, earlier. So um, on the three questions that I um, uh, started off with, um, in terms of how well is the current market design working in terms of supporting renewable rollout, you know, market design questions remain, though, as I speak to you today, um, you know, the, the situation looks pretty good at the moment for renewables, um, given the current high prices in the European um, electricity system. Um, it's certainly true that we need to sharpen ancillary service markets and reserve markets. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and our modeling suggested that as you roll out renewables, you don't suddenly observe a, a collapse in market prices. Um, they might gradually uh, fall as you add more um, zero short run marginal cost electricity generation. But there isn't this uh, sudden tipping point that you might uh, worry about. OK, let me... Um, Move on to the second thing I wanted to talk about was, well, you know, how significant do renewables need to be in a, a net zero um, Europe? Um, and here we, we did a, a, another study 
um, for the same uh, European think tank, the Center on Regulation in Europe, um, where we looked at um, both gas and electricity demand hourly across the year and how that could be served within a zero carbon electricity system. Um, we also had transport in there, but we didn't uh, explicitly model what was happening uh, in transport, though transport uh, demand had to be met. Um, our modeling is very similar in nature to uh, European Commission uh, modeling for um, net zero. Um, and our modeling does assume um, very high um, carbon prices by um, 2050. Um, what you end up with if you do some 2050 modeling of simply, you know, what would it take to decarbonize the 2018 energy system in Europe? Electricity turns out to be really significant in final, electric, final energy consumption at current expectations of costs and prices in 2050. Um, but it's not the only thing. So it's important to say that in Europe, you can't fully electrify um, the energy system. You're still going to have um, biomethane, uh, hydrogen and synthetic fuels um, produced from hydro combining hydrogen with captured CO2 um, to, uh, as important sources of energy in the 2050 energy mix. But the electricity system, it's true, is dominated by variable renewables. Of course, uh, it's actually 78% variable renewables, um, mostly wind and solar. Um, partly what's going on is a lot of the swing demand for electricity is the production of hydrogen. Um, so uh, it's not that um, you know, there's, there's more electricity being produced than, the fi than being finally consumed because a lot of the electricity is being used to produce hydrogen. Um, but, you know, renewables are going to be really important in the 2050 electricity system if we get to net zero, that's true. Um, um, but there are going to be important roles for these uh, other fuels um, and it's going to be extremely challenging to, to, to meet net zero. We're going to have to scale up biomethane um, production, production of hydrogen, synthetic fuels, uh, and bioenergy more generally. And carbon capture and storage turns out to be important. And if you, if you don't scale these things up, you just won't reach net zero. So net zero across the energy system as a whole remains extremely challenging. But wind and solar remain absolutely critical to achieving net zero and require a massive scale up, even from um, today's levels within Europe um, to meet 2050 uh, energy um, demands. OK, let me let me finish with some interesting um, recent experience from uh, Great Britain, where we have had uh, a massive expansion of renewables. Um, so if you look at that lower chart, we've gone from about 8%, 78% of um, total electricity generation being wind and solar to about 30% in 2020. It's been a huge expansion. It has been associated with some very recent rises in ancillary service costs. You can see a huge increase in 2020 in constraint costs. So not surprisingly, what happened in 2020, demand fell substantially. Renewables continued to increase, variable renewables, uh, and constraints increased in the system. So this is where you're having to pay renewable generators to not generate and pay other generators to generate in order to meet um, meet demand on the system. Um, and so this is one of the aspects of adding lots of variable renewables to the system. Sometimes they're generating too much electricity in the wrong places in your um, electricity grid. Um, and indeed, um, um, together with National Grid, I've been doing some analysis of this recently in terms of you know, what's been happening to monthly constraint costs and how they're related to the amount of variable renewable energy on the system. As you can see, in some months, so these are monthly figures, um, variable renewable energy hits 
uh, nearly 40% of total generation. Um, and indeed, the monthly volume of constraints seems to be positively related to uh, the amount of variable renewable generation. You know, when you think about the uh, Great Britain, there's a lot of renewables in Scotland. When that generation is peaking, that creates constraints in Scotland to get the electricity um, to the demand centres in, in England, as, uh, particularly around London. Um, and um, these physical uh, constraints in megawatt hours do translate into extra monthly constraint costs as variable renewable energy increases. Um, now that's that that's the bad news. There is some good news. Okay, the good news is that this is looking at another uh, aspect of ancillary service costs. So, so uh, Joe was talking about frequency response. We've got a, a competitive um, uh, uh, frequency response market in the UK, um, which is procured monthly. And you can see what's been happening to the unit price of that. So um, it, was, it was hovering at around £10 per megawatt per hour um, up until um, early 2017. And then in this phase two, it suddenly collapsed and the price went down to two. And you can see that did impact the monthly frequency response procurement costs, which went down from about six million to uh, about two million. Um, so what was going on? What was going on was there was an influx of batteries into the market, uh, helped by the fact that the uh, size threshold for playing in the frequency response market was reduced from 10 megawatts to one megawatt. And the, 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 the trading block, the block at which, in which the window in which you could specify your availability to provide frequency response was reduced, um, making it easier for um, battery providers to know when they might be needed to provide frequency response. Um, there were some additional attempts to procure batteries and get more batteries into the, into the market. But this shows you that with a competitive market for ancillary services and with the, the presence of new technologies, particularly batteries, you can see a massive reduction in some ancillary uh, costs in the face of rising uh, renewables being added to the system. Um, as, as a footnote, um, one of the reasons why the prices rose towards the end of that period into phase three uh, was because some of the batteries left the market to go to another market, which was offering higher prices, um, uh, which were uh, fixed, <laughs> um, which wasn't particularly uh, smart of the system operator to, to, to manage the market in that way. Um, so what can we... Um, conclude about um, rising uh, variable renewable electricity in in the system. Um, you know, ancillary service costs are an issue. It is going to be more costly to manage the uh, frequency and the power quality, and also the reserves in the in the system um, with more variable renewables. Um, this does seem to rise with more renewables. We're seeing evidence of that, potentially the, a threshold effect. You know, once you go above 20% wind and solar on your system, you see sharp rises in the requirements for um, ancillary services. Better modelling would help. Um, and competition in the procurement of ancillary services, um, bringing in smaller providers and um, also, new technologies such as batteries um, can um, massively reduce the unit cost of procuring ancillary services. And clearly, as a, as a system operator, you do need to worry about co-optimization. Um, batteries can provide multiple services to the market, and you need to optimize them across multiple services. And also, you need to optimize ancillary service procurement against um, available transmission and distribution capacity and, and the right incentives to invest in transmission and uh, distribution capacity. Um, okay, um, thank you very much.
um, for listening and I'm, I'm very happy to um, participate in any uh, debate or questions.